what is the most valuable idea at this moment in time, in your opinion? The most val valuable is hard. The most valuable idea that came out of our program is that human beings have the ability, the innate ability, to quiet their minds and see into the distance and see into the future. And I think that's the that's the big surprise that 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 the future the future not only can be known it is known. I think is a very valuable idea because what it see if if you believe what I just told you the future is not only can be known but it is known. What that shows is we significantly misapprehend the nature of the space time we live in. It's a pretty serious thing to misapprehend, but I think the data is overwhelming. Awesome. So, Russell, you were born in Chicago in 34 and then moved to Manhattan when you were a child. What was your That's right. what was childhood like in, and what was your upbringing like in, in the city at the time? Well, I grew up in Chicago. My father was a bookseller, yeah, a bookshop in downtown Chicago. And I had access there to all the magic books that he was selling. He was very interested in magic and the supernatural and science fiction. And his sh store was, his shop was frequented by a lot of fam famous people or who became famous people like Mario Puzo and so forth. So I got to meet a lot of famous authors as a little boy. And next door to him was a magic shop. So I was learning uh, little magic tricks when I was a kid. So I, I had an early interest in magic, sleight of hand, and the sort of things that you would give a little child. When I got to New York, I was fortunate to be able to have the run of the city so I could go to 42nd Street and see people doing magic uh, in professional settings. So I could sit up. My vision is very poor, as you may realize. So it was a treat for me to be able to sit in the first row of a magic shop and chat with the magician. And then as a 14-year-old, I could go upstairs to the retail store, chat with the magicians, and buy magic paraphernalia, which I could then use to supplement my 14-year-old magic on the, on the stage. So I was doing pretend magic as a 14-year-old. Eventually, I noticed that some of the time when I'd pretend to read somebody's mind, I actually had a picture of what they were thinking about or what their house looks like. And in due course, I found my way to the uh, American Society for Psychical Research. And they were very nice to a 14-year-old kid who doesn't see very well, but is interested in remote viewing or psychic abilities. So they gave me a lot of things to read. The fr friendly elderly women who ran that shop. So, and so you in the, in, the, in the beginning, my interest was in fake magic, and as I stood on the stage, I had firsthand experience with that fake magic, which is supplemented by a little real magic that would find its way in. And in due course, I got to be friends with Kreskin and Melbourne Christopher, who worked, who both were consulting for our remote viewing at SRI. The, Main thing we were concerned about regarding magic is that in our effort to have people learn to see into the distance, see into the future, we did not want to be see, we did not want to be deceived by the magician. Because if we ever got tricked by a, a fake coming into our lab, it would be the end of the program. So Great. in addition, in addition to my psychic prowess. Uh, I bought my way into the program because I said I was very familiar with stage magic and I could promise them that nobody was going to give me any wooden nickels as we went along. And that and that was very advantageous. So you mentioned that you 
were sort of inducted into the American Psychic Research Association. Is this back when you were the, the American Society for Psychical Research? They is the professional organization for people who look into um, clairvoyance and precognition on the university level. There's people like Ian Stevenson and Charlie Tart, all, yes. all the people you know who do who study psychic phenomena in the university. Did these people meet you um, at your father's bookstore or how were no, you? No, 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 no. They, these people were our, our university professors and I would meet them at meetings of the society. So I was just a kid then. I was a 14, 15 year old kid attending scientific meetings, but I had read the literature so I could talk a good game. And as I, as I was a child of the Depression, of course, as I grew, grew up in 1934. And I could look around at these very nice professors doing good stuff, and all of them were pretty poor. And I did not, I did not want to replicate that experience. So although my interest was in psychic ability, uh, I was also interested in physics. And I could do the uh, two for one trade and see that I could study physics and do psychic stuff on the side. And that's what I did. I got a degree in physics from Queens College, but I would, my passion was still psychic ability. So in the end, the end was 1972. In the end, I was very successful in doing laser stuff. I built a very powerful laser, which we could use to heat treat a locomotive cylinder or look for wind shear, wind hazards in front of airplanes. On the one side, on the other side, I was doing building laser stuff for NASA and for CIA. And by 72, I realized it was time to, what I say, shift to cut bait. I, I could go back to CIA, go back to NASA and say, I'm interested in teaching people how to get in touch with their psychic abilities. Right. And, so sort of before we jump far, that far ahead, um, you, you got your physics degree at Columbia, right? Um, and this that, is that, that, it would be nice if I did. I was a graduate student at Columbia, but I did not get a degree from there. I got a physics degree from Queens College. And so what was your stint in Columbia like? My trip at Columbia was not very good, <clears throat> very good. Although I was an A student at Queens College, which is a very friendly uh, city college in the city of New York, um, I was not prepared for Columbia. So Columbia, Columbia was interested in teaching people who were going to be the best physicists in the world. That was not me. And they were interested in brooming all the people out of Columbia who are not going to get Nobel Prizes. Interesting. I might, I might get a Nobel Prize for ESP one of these days, but <laughs> not but not for physics. What, so what? so oh. I, I made a lot of friends with people at Columbia. I met Gordon Gould, who invented the laser. And with that connection, as I was getting ready to leave Columbia, Gordon said that I see you're doing a lot of work with ionized gases. Uh, I'm building a thing called the laser, which I've just invented. And we're working with ionized gases to make lasers. Would you like to join my laboratory on Long Island and be part of our laser team, build the first laser? So that was very fortuitous. I was in the right place at the right time, and I said yes, which is what I frequently did in the course of my life. So is I it... spent three or four years with Gordon uh, building the first lasers. So is this part of the work that you did at Sylvania, or did that come sort of slightly Sylvania after? Sylvania came after that. 
Now, the oh. Sylvania was in Long Island, and what I discovered on the Upper West Side of New York is that although it's a terrific place to live, it is not a terrific place to raise little children. You have to well, just weed out the glass from the sandbox, and my wife doesn't like that. So she grew up on the West Coast, <clears throat> and there were ads in the scientific journal of people who would help set up a uh, laser laboratory, since nobody knew how to do that except a few of us, including me. So I had, so I took the flu to Palo Alto and had a number of positive interviews, and there was, I had no problem getting a job. Uh, and I chose General Telephone, which was part of Sylvania, and helped them set up a laboratory and then moved my family to Palo Alto, which was another good choice. The Palo Alto, I think, is one of the nicest places in the world with ideal weather <clears throat> and plenty of occupation and work for physicists. So, so you spent some time in Sylvania working on electro-optical devices. That's what I did. I was 10 years in Sylvania. I joined them in... Um, what, what were I, I, Sylvania you was on Long Island. Right, and I was just wondering, if you don't mind explaining, what are electro-optical devices, and, and what are some of the use cases for stuff like that? I'm sitting in front of an electro-optical device that's known as a, tele a television screen, you fire an electron beam at a screen which will turn electron beams into light as you can see. And that would be a television set. It has a powerful electron beam in the back and it strikes a photoluminescent screen replicating the variations in the electron beam. That's not what I was doing. <clears throat> I was building uh, laser devices where you excite a gas, and if you can excite some parts of the gas more than other parts, it can become a laser. And I was knowledgeable. I knew how to do that at a time when very, very few people knew how to do that. So I was able to set up a laser laboratory with a number of other competent people who had graduated from Stanford I hadn't graduated from any place in lasers, but I had uh, <clears throat> uh, several years work at technical research group with Gordon Gould. So I so I knew how to start from a piece of glass tubing and a transformer and make a laser out of it. And there are very, very few people who knew that uh, <clears throat> at that time. Interesting. After, after a decade at Sylvania, I had an idea for how to, these little lasers were used for little things around the laboratory or microsurgery. <clears throat> and, but because you couldn't make a big one, if they would get, as soon as they got hot, they quit lasing. They lost the laser property. But I had the idea that you could air condition a laser that is make a really big laser and blow cool air through it. And then the gas would not get hot, and the inversion, that the inversion where the <clears throat> what one quantity of the gas was uh, cooler than the other, you, it would they wouldn't heat up like a toaster, but you could blow cool air through it. And in fact, I went to Buffalo, New York, and bought a air cooler that you would use in an automobile together with an automobile uh, heat exchanger. So we had good size hardware, which is probably, you can probably see that behind me. There's a picture, picture of that, that. I'm standing in front of a large blue cylinder, uh, which could put out a thousand watts of energy. The, the <clears throat> thousand watts of energy would be in, compared with a milliwatt of energy, <clears throat> which had been the practice. So this laser was really amazing. It was the most powerful laser in the world at that time. So I was able to recognize 
and we were using that we sold that to General Electric for heat treating lo locomotive cylinders, and I showed it to the Army as a way of <clears throat> drilling holes through a fire brick. The Army couldn't believe that I had a thousand mile laser because they were tr they were trying very hard to make high power laser, which is impossible unless you have some kind of trick to prevent the whole thing from heating up. And I had thought of this trick, which allowed us to basically make an air conditioned laser. <clears throat> and the army came to us and they say, how do we know that that power meter is really reading a thousand watts? And I said, well, I tell you what, I'll burn a hole in a fire brick and then I'm gonna give you that red hot the fire brick and you can decide if it's a trick. And I did that and I could then hand the guy this fire brick with a red hot hole built, drilled through it. And I could tell him, here, look at that. And let me know if you want fries with that. <laughs> and and we, we, we were able to get ample support from the army and from other people. But yeah. I recognize that that was a good time for me to cash in my laser chips and see if I can get work setting up an ESP laboratory. So I went to my friends at the CIA for whom I had built stuff with lasers, which I still can't tell you about. Is this before or after that you did some work at um, Sperry Rand Corporation? Is this before, before I did work where? So you went from Sylvania and you joined Sperry Rand, right? Um, I was a, I, yeah, I went to Sperry after TRG, after. after I went to Sperry after I was working with Gordon Gould. Did that answer your question? I, yeah. worked, I I left Columbia to work with Gordon, and then I left Gordon with the tiny little lasers to move to Sylvania, where I built bigger and bigger lasers. And then I was building lasers so big, I realized I could trade my lasers in for a real job doing uh, ESP work. So I, I, by coincidence, I was invited to a NASA conference on speculative technology, and I wrote a whole paper on the chain of coincidences. Anyway, somebody wa somebody walked in a lecture that I gave on lasers, and they invited me to come to a NASA meeting on speculative technology. And at that meeting, I met Werner von Braun, who was very interested in my ESP stuff, which was a great surprise. So I had my ESP teaching machine with me, which I can show you briefly on the screen here. Um, I think, you know, Russell, I think we're, we're, we're probably moving. Okay, so here I am with Werner von Braun. I have this ESP teaching machine where you press one of these squares, and if you press the one that's gonna be illuminated, it'll ring a bell. And Von Braun was very excellent at that and rang the bell frequently and drew a crowd. And he said, I used to do this with my grandmother who is very psychic. And I said, she, and he said, well, what do you wanna do with it here? Do you have any application for NASA? And I said, yes, I wanna, teach astronauts to get in touch with their psychic abilities. And I think that we can avoid accidents like we had with Apollo 13, where the oxygen tank failed and nobody on board knew that it was a failure and the spacecraft almost crashed. There had to be instructions from the ground how to all <clears throat> wire the pieces together with literally duct tape. So there was a whole several hours of wrapping things together with duct tape so you could get oxygen from where it was not needed to where the astronauts needed it. And they managed to survive, <clears throat> but they didn't get to the moon. And Von Braun said, yes, I'm very familiar with uh, Apollo 13. That was really a close call. If you think you could help astronauts get in touch with the spacecraft, that would be very useful. Now, right. of course, of course, I I can tell you 
but I basically made that up on the spot. There was a famous foundation science fiction story with with uh, Isaac Asimov and the the very brilliant semanticist and foundation said, what we learn in semantics is that nothing has to be true, it just has to sound true. So my scheme of saving the spacecraft sounded true. So Werner von Braun, the inventor of Apollo rockets, took me to meet the administrator of the NASA program, Jim Fletcher, and said, Target has built lasers for us in the past. We know him. And the idea that he could help prevent accidents like we had with Apollo 13, he wants to set up a laboratory to teach people to be psychic. Great. So, you know, just not to 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 move too far past um, and into the ESP research, because you spent some time working at Lockheed as well. Would that be La later? Oh, this is after? Okay. That was, that was after, after. Lockheed was after NASA. Oh, okay. So so you, you end up going and saying... I, 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 I misspoke. I'm very sorry. Um, no worries. I, 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 was at, I was at General Telephone, Sylvania. See, all these companies have, have multiple names, which is a confusion. There's, Sylvania is also known as General Telephone. It, be, it became General Telephone after I joined them. Right. And, and I, I left I left General Telephone and went to work um, at SRI. I created this laser lab at, at a company that did exist called SRI, Stanford Research Institute, which had been part of Stanford. So I, I spent a decade uh, doing just what I told Von Braun I would do, <clears throat> spent a decade teaching people how to get in touch with their psychic abilities. And, what and was... that's, pro that's probably why you and I are here today. <laughs> <clears throat> so what was the... Um... So the payoff was Von Braun took me to Jim Fletcher and Fletcher said, well, we could support, Targo only wants $80,000, which is not very much money. If you got a place to work, uh, we could support him to do that. And at that moment, uh, Ed Edgar Mitchell came walking by, and he is fresh from walking on the moon. And he said, well, I can help Targ because I know the president of Stanford Research Institute, Charlie Anderson, and because I'm doing work for them right now. <clears throat> so I, if if you promise him some money, I could then set up a meeting with myself, fresh from the moon, to meet Charlie Anderson and help stimulate a <clears throat> program at SRI. And coincidentally, the week before this happened, Hal Putoff, another laser physicist, was in the newspaper in Palo Alto advertising a lecture he was giving on American and Soviet research. I went to that lecture he gave, it sounded a lot like me. And I said, I am invited <clears throat> to a NASA conference on speculative technology. And I'm going to tell them about the, um, what do I tell them? Tell them about my interest in psychic abilities. And I think that I could maybe get some support from NASA. If I could get some NASA support, Hal, would you be interested in supporting me at SRI? I brought in my own money. Would that interest you to set up an ESP lab? And Hal said, that's exactly what I want to do. Because <clears throat> SRI is like a farmer's market that is there. Hundreds of independent little laboratories people like me who have ideas that the government will support. And what Hal explained to me is that if you show up with your little wheelbarrow full of stuff, including money, then you can bring your project and your money to SRI, and SRI will let you do it. So Hal and I and Edgar Mitchell had a meeting with Charlie Anderson, the president of SRI, 
And Anderson said, well, that sounds pretty interesting. If you guys can support yourself financially and keep a low profile, I can let you do your work at SRI. So that was a, so that was a stream of things involving Hal Pudroff, uh, Edgar Mitchell, and other helpful people. Interesting. And so did you, did you, where did you get your funding from? Because you mentioned you got independent funding. Was that just from NASA or? Uh, we got 80K from NASA. We got $50,000 from Edgar Mitchell with his new foundation to the um, Noetic Institute. No, Noetic Institute gave me some money. And I met uh, Werner von Braun. No. Von Braun did not give us money. He helped us get money from NASA to support my ESP teaching machine. And so, we were we were ready, ready to go. So what was Hal Putoff's contribution to that program? In what ways did he... Did Hal he Putoff brought us Ingo Swan. Hal was in con, um, communication correspondence with Ingo. He had written to a New York ESP researcher, and Ingo was visiting that person. There was a New York researcher who was interested in psychic interaction between people and plants. And you might be able to rem <clears throat> remember him. But anyway, Ingo was introduced to Hal through Hal's letter to this uh, New York researcher. So Hal invited him to come to SRI to work with him because Hal was already known as a prodigiously psychic person. So, 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 so by the time I came to SRI, Hal and Ingo were already doing experiments. Interesting. So, so in addition to Ingo Swan, you, you had several other people that you had part of this program when you were doing experiments, right? Pat Price, um, Joseph. Well, Pat Price, Hal and I and Ingo we're already doing experiments. We were doing sort of psychic hide and go seek, which is the experiment that Ingo invented for remote viewing. Hal and I didn't know anything except what we read in the literature. <clears throat> so we were having having Ingo describe the picture on the wall in the next room or the picture in the envelope. And Ingo said, this is a trivialization of my ability. I can focus my attention anywhere on the planet and you're giving me these junk experiments. I had to leave. And we we said, well, Ingo, what do you want to do? He said, I'll have somebody go hide in the San Francisco Bay Area and I will describe where they are. And that, and he said, we can call that remote viewing. Interesting. And, and that particular experiment is something that was actually described uh, by Carl Jung as a criticism of <clears throat> Ryan's work. Ryan was doing card guessing. He's famous for his card guessing, where you would get odds uh, that were statistically significant, but you had to do thousands and thousands of trials because the ability to describe t target pictures is very weak. See, if, I, if you know that the tip, this is just, in, psychic, in teaching psychic ability, what I have to do is help the person separate the psychic signal from the mental noise. And Carl Jung understood that. So when he visited Le Ryan's laboratory, he said, Ryan is having people look at his circle, square, stars, wavy lines, and then guess which one they were going to see in the envelope. But a person who has already seen circle squares and wavy lines has burned those into their memory. So I tell, if I ask you, I got a deck of cards here, and I just pulled out a card, you have a lifetime experience with cards. The ace of spades is the one that pops right to memory. And the fact that you know the target pool greatly interferes with your ability to be to see the, the picture psychically. Whereas if I tell you Hal is hiding someplace in the San Francisco Bay Area where you have rivers and bridges and bowling alleys and 
schools and all kinds of things. Uh, hell is hiding someplace and I have no idea where it is. Can you describe your feelings right now, your mental pictures regarding where hell is and we will take you there. So you can, I'm sure that you can feel the difference between that and guessing a playing card. Interesting. So, so Ingo understood all that and he was able to very successfully describe where people were hiding and in the course of our work, uh, Pat, Pat Price, this is already being supported by the CIA. As soon as we demonstrated that we can hide where an agent has been captured or kidnapped, CIA is on board to give us money. <clears throat> so at this point, I assume that you guys graduated from somewhat of a simple research program to a larger, um, more serious CIA-supported program. Now, that's our, right. It was you... still pretty small. It was still Hal and me and a couple of other people and Ingo. So uh, you... when Pat Price learned about our program, he joined right in. So we then had uh, Hal and Ingo and Pat Price. And Pat was a prodigiously successful person. He was a person who lived as a psychic psychic person he could describe any person anywhere and we never saw anybody like that and the cia watched him do this magic and said well if we can train it you can train up agents to do what they're doing but how do you know you'll be able to make another pat price and i said i don't know that of course but i think that i have a good idea how to train people to be psychic I have a friend, Hilla Hamid, who's a professional photographer, and I think she would agree to come play ball with us, especially if we paid her. So Hella, the woman of the world, she was born in, she's a German Jewish refugee, traveled all over the world, spoke many languages, was a highly regarded photographer, and our friend of our family. So indeed, Hella thought it would be really very amusing to have a, as a new job being a psychic for the CIA. She'd never done anything like that, but she thought that would be very interesting and she'd be happy to work with her, work with me because we had a very nice friendship. So we did these ex same experiments as we did with Pat Price, where I would take Hella up to our quiet little remote viewing room. She could lay down on the couch and I would say, uh, Hal put up has been taken somewhere in the Bay Area. I have no idea where it is, but I can help you get rid of the mental noise. I I'm allowed to chat with you because I have no idea where it's gone. So I can help you uh, do remote viewing things rather than guessing things. So, so there's no, no problem with my talking to Hella because I don't know anything. I, I have no information I can give her because I have no idea where Hell has gone. <clears throat> so we did, initially we did nine trials with Pat Price and he did extremely well describing where Hell was put where I was hiding. In fact, he got of the nine trials he did, seven of them were described so accurately that a perceptual psychologist got seven of them correct, which is to say that if Hal had been kidnapped nine days in a row and we looked where Pal, Pat had sent us, we would have found Hell's hiding place seven out of nine times, which is quite, quite remarkable. That was remarkable. It may not sound remarkable to you, but it's remarkable enough to get published in Nature magazine, which is very hard to get anything published in, let alone an ESP journal. Yeah, that's a, a statistically significant result. Um, yeah, yeah, significant results about one in a hundred thousand to get uh, 
seven out of nine first place matches. Did you so guys? We, go ahead. Did you guys in any way try to use technology to sort of isolate some of the signals? You mentioned that one of the issues you faced was sort of the the need to have an individual who is trying to do this remote viewing um, be fully aware and and focus on that um, place or time that they were trying to trying to view. Did you ever use technology to sort of amplify that process in any way? We we did not. We we were familiar with the we were we were trying to psych our intention was to try and separate the psychic signal from the metal noise. That's what we were fo focused on. Did and you we, we didn't know how to do that with technology. No EKGs. Uh, so so I then went to work with Hella on the same things that Pat Price did so well. And her job, I would sit with her in this comfortable remote viewing room. And we did nine trials with her. And she was even more successful than Pat Price. And that, that really changed the whole ball game. The CIA had the, everybody knew that Hella was a delightful woman, woman of the world, very friendly, cheerful. She walked in and she turned out to be the most psychic person we'd ever seen. And she had no idea of that and neither did we. But the CIA caught on and said, that means that you have a technology that allows you to teach people how to get in touch with their psychic abilities, which is exactly what I had promised the CIA that I could do before I had any evidence that I could actually do that. But from my own life experience, I had an idea that I could teach people to be psychic because of the psychic things that had crept into my stage magic as a child. I felt that psychic ability is not that elusive. I think that if you got the right people in the right setting, you teach them to be psychic. So at what point did you scale this up and start doing work for both the CIA, the NSA, the DIA, and NASA? Well, in about our third, fourth year, Hella came along. And it turned out that Hella was able to do as well or better than Pat Price. She was not as psychic as Pat Price but she was more able to get away from guessing than he was. That as Pat Price got not seven correct out of nine, she didn't do that well, but she got very few errors in what she had to say. So Hella's psychic, Hella's the psychic hide and go seek we did it with Hella was significant in a million to one, which where price was only a hundred thousand to one. Hella had no significant errors in her trials. So whereas we went, we were able to publish our nine trials with Hella in Nature magazine, we could wrap up our trial our trials of a thousand to one, million to one and send that to nature to the Institute of Electrical Engineers, where which is the home for Hal and me. Hal and I were accustomed to publishing things in the Institute of Electrical Engineers because electrical engineering is what we had done. We were, they knew they knew us. So in, in a certain sense we could parlay our publication in nature to get a paper published in Proceedings of the IEEE. It wasn't all that easy, for example. Uh, I was pretty skillful at getting people say say yes to me from my life experience as an only child. But we sent this paper into the Proceedings of the IEEE and the editor of that magazine, Bob Lucky, said, yeah, I know who you guys are. Your, your laser engineer, what makes you think you know how to do ESP work? I said, well, we've done this stuff. We publish it in Nature. He said, well, I have a review of your paper from the vice president of Hewlett-Packard, 
And he said, this is the kind of thing I wouldn't believe even if it were true. And Bob Lucky said, that makes it hard for me to publish. And I said, well, Bob, um, I understand your problem. How would it be if I went to your lab in Murray Hill, it's a laser lab of Bell Labs, and I trained some people to do just what our people did, and then you would go hide someplace every day for five days, and they would describe where you were. And they did as well as Helen did her path. Will you be able to publish that? We gave you a re replicable experiment that you were able to do at Murray Hill. <clears throat> and you say, well, if you could do that with my people, well, I got to choose the hiding place, I would publish your paper. And of course, the result of that was that I had a little seance with his five engineers who I would warm up to remote viewing. He would go and hide someplace in the, in the Murray Hill area, which is a medium-sized community in New Jersey. And every day for five days, Bob Lucky would hide someplace, and one of his engineers would describe what it looked like where he was hiding and draw a picture. And when the five week, five days was over, Bob Lucky would come back to the lab and they would show you, uh, here are the five sets of drawings which is supposed to correspond to where you were each day. Can you tell what we were thinking about each day? And Lucky was able to match up all five of the drawings with the five places he had gone to hide and 100% success. And he published our paper in the proceedings of the IEEE. I think that's that's somewhat of an, you know, a testament to to your work. But how how is it that you dealt with sort of skepticism and criticism from the mainstream of science? Um, people who felt as if that they, they were qualified enough to to disregard this. What, what was your response to your colleagues at the time? Well, the response to our work when we first presented it to the parapsychology community is we must be either cheating or deceived by wily crooks. But we had, we did have some friends there. Charlie Tart knew us beforehand. And he said, I don't think they're cheating. They, could, they might be deceived, but I, I know Russ and Hell said Charlie, and I'm sure that they're not cheating. And what what happened then is that other laboratories began to replicate our work. University of Chicago did two series of nine trials and got results ju just as we did. And then Princeton University with Dean John, the Dean of the University was interested in our work. And he also was able to do this successfully. So people got the idea that if we could publish this stuff in the proceeding of the IEEE and serious-minded people all over the world were replicating our work, that it might be true. Yeah. yeah it's, the, it's the idea that we had a replicable project. Today, today is easier. Today, I would just tell people we worked for the CIA for 20 years finding kidnapped hostages down to airplanes and other other useful things found. Uh, Great. So, so, so we yeah. worked for the CIA. And the other thing we did is we found a way to harness remote viewing in such a way as we could make money in the stock market. So we did a series of experiments that I could tell you about where we made a trial a week for nine weeks. And the viewer, Keith Harari, had to guess or describe what we would give him for feedback the following Friday. And he got all all nine of those trials correct. And the broker got seven out of nine correct. He didn't hit no misses, but two of them 
wound up with our betting that the market was going down at a time when he was sure it was going up. And he said, since we're betting large amounts of money, I don't want to have to go back to our investor and say we lost $25,000 because the market went down because everybody knows it's not going down. So, so our investment record in the market was of our investments, all of the investments, all nine of our investments were correct and we made a quarter million dollars. Yeah, I think one of the main criticisms, and, and I've heard this quite a bit, as I'm sure you have, is if it worked so well, why didn't you just continue um, and make a billion? Well, that's really not a very informed criticism. It is, I'm sure, but... If we, if we set off an atomic bomb, why didn't we set off some more? <laughs> that's a good point. I, th I think that's his... That's it. That's as good a point as you could as you could say about that. But do you, so? Do the, you... the 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 answer is uh, doing these experiments is not as easy as they describe. It leaves out all the human interactions, and I just tell you basically what happens in the paper. Um, one of the things that happened is that the broker was aware that we're playing with real money. That if Keith Harari, for example, and a, a part of the, these experiments don't look like physics experiments. So I would sit with uh, Harari at my coffee table on a Friday morning and say, okay, Keith, uh, I'm gonna give you something interesting in your hand See that we would do this on a, on a Monday morning, and I would say on Friday I'm going to give you something interesting in your hand. Can you tell me what you experience now with regard to what I'm going to put in your hand? And in this interesting science experiment, or I might say, well, I feel something round, and it has a bad smell, and it's kind of floppy. That's what I get. And from my experience, I would say, well, that's a terrific description of something or other. Of course, I don't have any idea what it is. But on Friday, I trust we will find something just like that to hand you. So he went home to Berkeley. I called my broker in Marin and said, I think we've got a really hot description of something. What what, what do you have in the, the office? He said, well, I got a cup of coffee and I got a vase of flowers and I got a flashlight and I got a leftover pancake from breakfast. Well I said, well, of my three three things of my four things, what do you think he's describing? He said, well, certainly sounds to me like he's describing my leftover pancake. And I said, well what does that mean? He said, well that that corresponds to down a lot. We call this associative remote viewing. You can't ask somebody to read what it says on the big board in the commodity exchange. People are not able to read things psychically. But if I give them a matching object, then they can tell me what they're going to experience later. And and we all, we all understood that. Now, Stephen Schwartz invented this remote viewing from being in the Navy, he said, you might be in a ship and you want to contact a neighboring ship <clears throat> uh, to pull into shore. And you can't send them that in the Morse code because the bad guys can read your Morse code. But if you can wave a seminar, semaphore flag, they could quickly look at a semaphore flag and see where you're going. That's kind of a remote viewing task. We, we can't tell them about buy silver, but we can show them what they will see for feedback at the end of the experiment. So for example, our broker will say, well, the, the leftover pancake, certainly the good match for my leftover pancake at breakfast. 
And I said, well, what, what does that mean? He said, well, that means down a lot. So based on that, we would spend $35,000 selling silver because the guy smelled a pancake. So we've got to be pretty courageous to do this in the market. <clears throat> That's why we didn't get a lot of we didn't get a lot of replications because you really have to have confidence that you know what you're doing. I think so we did so we did that <clears throat> in, in the market. We did that nine times altogether. And our broker did not like our forecast in two of them. That is to say, and in two of our trials, we were forecasting things going down and the market was going up. And he said, you know, I, I'm dealing with a wealthy investor supporting your work. And he's going to say, you had me sell, selling silver in an up market and they're going to think I'm stupid. So I said, okay, you can pass if you want to pass. So he made seven investments, which were all correct. And he passed two times, and our forecast was correct. So, so what the way we would describe it is to say all nine of Harari's forecasts were correct, and seven of them were invested correctly, and we made a quarter million dollars. So that's, that's, that's why that's why we believe in ESP. So you made the comparison earlier when I asked um, that, you know, why you, you maybe wouldn't want to repeat it because ESP is somewhat similar to the, you know, the reason why you'd want to repeat this ESP program is for the same reason you would want to um, repeat a nuclear bomb test. And, and so how is it that you balanced sort of the ethical and moral responsibilities of being a researcher and a human being, especially when when some of your remote viewing data is being used for military and intelligence purposes. Well, I'll answer your first question. Doing these experiments is very stressful on all the people who are doing them. That I describe it as working the work at working with Hella is very pleasurable. We enjoyed each other. But in all these things, we realize that uh large amounts of money are involved. And in a certain sense, we're aware that we don't know what we're doing, but we're um, entangled with a phenomenon that we know how to channel. So uh, the whole thing is very stressful, especially for a physicist, because you'd like to, if I've got a, I've got a thousand watt laser, the guy says, I don't believe you, I can hand them the red hot fire brick and he said well gee how did you do that and i can tell him exactly how i did that i, I had a heat exchanger from an automobile and a big blower and this and that and that's how we did it <clears throat> now i don't know how to explain that harari saw a pancake so we know that people Phenomenologically, as we would say in the science lab, uh, we know we know that if you help a person quiet his mind and focus his attention on what he's going to experience, and that's what I tell a viewer. That is, we had people who were going to support our work right up, including the Secretary of Defense, the Secretary of Defense. It was Walter LaBerge, the Secretary, uh, Secretary of Defense at that time. No, he was the assistant, uh, really I'm hedging, the Assistant Secretary of Defense at that time. So he came in and said, I know you, you guys are interested in setting up a psychic army corps and we will give you men to train, but I want you to show me something psychic. And I said, I can, I can do that. He said, who will you have for a viewer? He said, his idea was, LeBaire's idea, he would sit with me and I would produce Ingo Swan or Pat Price and they would describe where he's hiding. But I know for a fact that if I did that, he would have his full attention focused on how did the target do that trick? How were they deceived? 
And I told him that. And I said, because you're going to go back to Washington, I want you to focus on how you did this rather than how we fooled you. So your your major can go and hide somewhere with Hal put off, and we will randomly choose a tri- driving instructions from the safe and hand that to your major, and then you will go someplace in the Bay Area. They will go someplace in the Bay Area, and I will help you describe <clears throat> where they've gone. So, so Russ, he said, I don't. He said, I don't even believe in this stuff. Yeah. So, I, I was wondering, just, just to move on a little bit from that, I was wondering if this claim was true that you, um, as a result of this project, um, faced sort of an investigation by the FBI, and you ended up losing your security clearance, um, and then you know. We're facing legal threats in some sense. Is that is that a true thing? See, let me finish my Wally LaBear story, and then I will try and remember uh, the answer to your question. Uh, so, I just sat with LaBear and said, "I'm I'm going to take you to an interesting place. I don't know where it is, and I want you to." Tell me what you're experiencing now. That you're going to experience something surprising. I don't know what it is, but we'll all go there together. And since none of us know what it is, and what I'm asking you to do is to describe what you're going to be experiencing. So you can't do that wrong, because you're the only person who knows what you're going to be experiencing. So I want you to quiet your mind and just tell me what we what you're going to experience a half hour from now. And he could then describe a circular brick building with chairs sitting around it. And Hal and the Major would come back and take us to something called Allied Arc, which is a outdoor pavilion, which is a circular fountain and chairs sitting around it. And LaBerge could then compare his drawing of a circular brick building with chairs with uh, what he just drew. And so he was quite convinced. And that was the beginning of a 10-year army program that was known as Stargate. So the Stargate program was started by Walter LaBerge being able to describe the hiding place of his major. So we supported our program by showing skeptics how to do remote viewing. Right. Now, now you wanted to know something about an investigation. Right, so there's... And there was an investigation that we went to... But, but it wasn't about cheating. They wanted to know how we knew something. And we just had to explain to them. That we, early in the program, Pat Price and Ingo Swan had looked into a super secret listening post of the NSA. And Price was able to describe some of the ongoing secret or top secret programs. We described that in the film. So we have Kit Green and Ken Chris on screen looking into the camera and said it's really true that those psychics were able to describe top secret programs of ongoing programs. That is not only were they top secret, but they were ongoing programs. And you have Pat Price with the big blue eyes. I misspoke. Kit Green with his big blue eyes looking into the camera and said, I was there with Targ. And Price really described um, just, just what we found. And did that in any way result in you losing your security clearance? or No, that, that, that did not. Because that was... There was 
there was no way to cheat in that experiment. We had geographical coordinates from Kit Green of something, and the thing that we had coordinates of couldn't be penetrated. So you couldn't get into the uh, Sugar Grove facility. There's a top secret NSA facility where people weren't even supposed to know what NSA means. So the fact that Pat Price could penetrate that building and describe what was going in the basement that contained the name, uh, the top secret name of the program. There, there, was, there was no non-magical explanation for that. I mean, even if you, even if you had a Soviet spy helping you, uh, that wouldn't be the cause of a small investigation that would basically blow up the whole program because you're able to describe the most secret thing that the most secret agency has. Right. And so does, you know, was there any point in your life where you used your um, education on remote viewing in your personal life, um, you know, for things as simple as losing objects and, and attempting to find them? Well, I think that I probably always did that. One of the things that came comes to mind is uh, uh, in, in spite, people want to know how do I ride my motorcycle even though I'm considered legally blind. And I rode my motorcycle for 35 years through the hills and valleys of Silicon Valley. And there was one time that I remember <clears throat> driving down a medium busy road and I began to hallucinate, what would I do if there was a board across the road here and I hit that at 40 miles an hour? And I thought that would be a very bad outcome. So I was just thinking about that. I slowed down, pulled the curve, went slower and slower. And when the board appeared, I was going slow enough so I could just bounce over it and not crash my motorcycle and fall into traffic. So I think probably... All my life, I've been using psychic abilities of one kind or another in my life. Interesting. There's a nice story that I've never told before. Um, in the early, like, let's say 20 years ago, uh, I was sitting in church. I was going to sell my previous book uh, called Limitless Mind. I was trying to sell that to a publisher. And uh, through non-psychic means, I knew that that publisher had just published a book by Deepak Chopra and made a lot of money. It was Chopra's book about how to do psychic investing. And he may have sold a million dollars on that. So I thought that these guys really have money. And they were lecturing, the publisher was lecturing at my church. I'm trying to remember the name of the publisher, it doesn't matter. New World Library was the publisher. So I had the idea that I would just meet him in church and hand him the manuscript. I thought that was an auspicious way to do it. So I was sitting in church with the manuscript in my lap and this beautiful young woman came walking up to me saying, hi there, what, what, are you, what are you doing here, this big manuscript? And I said, well, I finished a book and I'm going to try and sell it to the publisher. And she said, well, that was very, very interesting. This is a psychic book you've written. And I said, yeah. She said, well, Reason I came over to you is you're sitting here in the dark, and as I look over at you, you seem to be glowing. And I thought that was very interesting, said she. So I said, Well, you want to go with me when I give this to the publisher? I thought things always go better with a beautiful girl on hand. So she went with me, and we publisher bought the book, and we got married. That's a, another happy remote viewing story.
that that's probably the happiest remote viewing story. That's all. And, and we're married just about 20 years now. My wife's name is Patricia. That's wonderful. Con congratulations. That's, I guess it's, it's quite late now, but that's amazing. Um, you know, I was just, just wondering what, you know, you, you spent a lot of time working on ESP and to you, some of these things might seem quite mundane after all this time, but what would you say to someone who is somewhat open-minded, but critical in their perspective, um, who's open to learning new things about somewhat heretical science, trying to get into this, um, or if he, I know exactly what to tell him if he's a scientist. Yeah. If if he's a non-scientist and he wants to know how it works, I'm going to say it's too. I'm going to tell him it's too complicated. If we, it, we have an idea how it works, but you have to be willing to know a little bit of physics. So for if it's example, a, for example, we we think that we we explain this. Because we live in a universe that has non-local connections, and people have just gotten no three guys just got a Nobel Prize for research in non-locality. That makes things easier for us for entanglement. So we think we Elizabeth Rauscher was my partner in this, and she said, "You uh, you live in a everyone knows that we live in a universe." That's uh, considered to be uh, three spatial dimensions in one time dimension. Einstein told us about that. And he learned about the time dimension from Minkowski in 2001. Minkowski was a uh, ge geometrical mathematician. There's a nicer name for him than that. But he was able to get Einstein interested in including the time dimension in his geometry for for relativity, and that allowed Einstein to solve the equations uh, which you can't do with ordinary um, elements. So if you so if you have a universe that has real parts and imaginary parts. We're not creating any new, we're not creating any new dimensions. We're just saying that there are real parts and imaginary parts to the space time we live in. <clears throat> what that means is there will always be a path from one place to another uh, that has zero total lengths. Because if you remember from plane geometry, the hypotenuse of a triangle is an x squared plus y squared equal to z squared. Now, if it turns out that those numbers involve complex numbers, some x squared plus y squared will add to zero because when you square an imaginary number, it can turn out to be zero. So, what we say is that in a complex space-time, you'll have a total of eight dimensions. Now, we're not creating any new dimensions. We're saying that you have the ordinary dimensions, x squared, y squared, and z squared, and time, those four dimensions, x squared, y squared, and z squared, including time. So you have three, dim three spatial dimensions and one time dimension. If those are also complex numbers, then squaring them will in general give you one set of numbers that add to zero. And if we live in a complex space-time, see Minkowski talked about complex space-time a hundred years ago to help Einstein solve relativity. So we're going to bring up your Minkowski again to help us with a complex space-time to describe the space-time that we live in. And in complex space-time, there will always be a path of zero distance. So we think that when I, when Hella sits down to describe where you are, 
there be a path from her to you that has zero distance. So that's the path she takes. Interesting. And so is this a new field in some sense that you, you believe exists or is this some connection that the mind has? Do you sort of subscribe to the Penrose microtubulars sort of idea or what what what's your belief behind how that well, the microtubule is really a description of how the brain has access to um distant points in space time so i really don't know uh, i i know that the, some physicists like the microtubules i, I don't <clears throat> know enough about it one or the other but i i know that he and other physicists have write, written about that. And so did, did you guys have a branch of the ESP program that focused on formulating the theoretical models more um, specifically? No, we didn't think we knew enough how to do that. So we, we were able to support our work if we could propose that we could do something and describe the distance and have that correct. So we we were, it's it's often hard to verify things that are forecast in theoretical physics. Uh, I'm basically an experimental physicist, so if I sit with Ingo, as I did one day, and a contract monitor who supported my ESP game comes in and said, "Are you actually able to teach people to do that?" And that's what a contract monitor does. He comes in and says. We're giving you a lot of money. Does this thing actually work? And we could show them a chart where we're working with 150 people, and quite a number of them get, are getting statistically significant gain in their ability to choose the red one when the red one is correct. And he turns to Ingo and said, Well, that's very interesting. I, I know that you're not interested in ESP games. But we're sending a Pioneer spacecraft to Jupiter next week. Could you take a look at Jupiter and tell us now if we're going to find anything interesting that we didn't know about uh, uh, before we launched the rocket? And he says, yeah, I can do that. Give me, give me a piece of paper and I'll tell you what you're going to find on Jupiter. So he go took a piece of paper and he said, well, here's Jupiter. He says, I look at Jupiter, it's surprising to see there's a, a large ring all the way around Jupiter. And the contract man said, you're, you're thinking of Saturn, aren't you? And he goes, I've been looking at the solar system my entire life. You got to believe I know the difference between Jupiter and Saturn. When you get your spacecraft to Jupiter, I want you to send me back a picture, and that picture will have a, be a representation of what you see around the edge of Jupiter, which are rings that are much bigger than around Saturn. And we, I published that picture in, in, in my book, the first, public, first publication I think of the Jupiter pictures that appear here. And in fact, seven months later, when the spacecraft got to Jupiter, they did send us back pictures. And the pictures are just like, just as Ingo drew. So Ingo was able to, the, the miracle of that is not obvious unless you're a physicist. <clears throat> the miracle is that Jupiter is 500 million miles away, much farther than the sun. So if it's 500 million miles away, that would say that it's 400 light minutes away. So if you're looking at Jupiter right now, you can't see Jupiter right now because it would take 400 minutes, I guess, I think, for 400 minutes for the signal to get from Jupiter to where we are right now. 
So you can't you can't look at Jupiter and say what's happening unless you happen to be Ingo Swan, because Ingo's picture describes very accurately what was seen on Jupiter when they took that picture. So not only was he able to describe something 500 million miles away, he could describe what it looks like 400 minutes into the future, which physicists don't like because that's highly accurate drawing pictures faster than the speed of light. Right. And so just, just curious, um, at what point did your life path cross with Jack's, Jack Sarfati? Let's see, Jack found us early in the program. We had, I had a ongoing program called Parapsychology Refer Research Group, which had a number of distinguished researchers, ESP researchers, and some physicists. Who were, who were interested in our work. And Jack had Elizabeth Rauscher, I know how to, Elizabeth Rauscher, who's my buddy on the theoretical side, ran something called the Theoretical Physics Group at Berkeley. So she was a professor at Berkeley, and she had the Theoretical Physics Group, which included Jack and a number of other theoretical physicists at the University of California and Berkeley. And Elizabeth brought Jack, um, Elizabeth, Elizabeth brought Jack uh, to our, our meeting. And so, so Jack came to a, so Jack's introduction to the parapsychology activities was through Elizabeth Rauscher. And what was, what was his function at the time um, in regards to your project? He's chatting with us about theoretical, about how it could possibly work. Elizabeth had already figured out this complex eight space. As a theoretical physicist interested in psi, I think she had been working on that problem off to the side for some time. Though uh, I was also interested in the complex thing. So the first time that I heard about the idea of complex space-time was with Elizabeth Rauscher in Central Park, where we sort of described it in words, just what we had in mind, the, a complex space-time. And I said, well, the smartest man I know is working only a, a few blocks from here, and that's Gerald Feinberg, who's my lifetime buddy and bridge partner, and we and he grew up to be chairman of the physics department at Columbia. See, he led me a stream. See, I thought Gary was just my my buddy that we played bridge together and talked about metaphysics as equals. So when he went to Columbia, I went to Columbia. Feel I would just hang out with my hang out with my friend Gary. And I went there. I had a fellowship, which was nice. So I I looked very good on paper. The Columbia accepted me and gave me a research research associate. And so you and, must have well in at Queens College to get accepted into Columbia, right? Yeah, I did well at Queens College. Come on. And, and Gary got his PhD the following year. Took him only two years at Columbia to get his PhD, and he quickly was invited to be the chairman of the physics department, which he did for quite a number of years. Interesting. And so, you know, one of the things that I'm sort of curious about... So, so that, that was the answer that uh, Elizabeth Rauscher and I were talking about theoretical physics, and she knew about our parapsychology research group, and she brought Jack to meet with Hal Putoff and me and this little group. And, and and was that the fundamental physics group or? Well, the fundamental physics group was Elizabeth's group at, at Berkeley. She had a regular fundamental physics group that met weekly at Berkeley. I don't drive, so uh, fundamental research. So anything happening at Berkeley is out of reach for me. 
I can ride my motorcycle to Stanford, but I can't ride my motorcycle to Berkeley. So, so I really had nothing. I may have gone a couple of times with Elizabeth or and Hal. Hal would drive me there. But I, I was not a, a regular member of, of that group just because out, out of my range. Right. And so, you know, one of the things that I'm curious about, um, Russell, is how you integrate your knowledge on ESP and sort of the scientific findings surrounding that with your spiritual beliefs. Um, does Do those things contradict for you or, or how or in what way do they relate for you? I was reaching all oh, the, the answers on the wall right behind me in my room. We've got you got a picture of a shiny picture of somebody, and that somebody is named here he is the name Padmasambhava. He wrote a book called Self Liberation Through Seeing with Naked Awareness, and he was involved in something called timeless awareness, which he felt that all people have in their nature. Timeless awareness. We're talking about 800 years ago. Padmasambhava was a famous guru in India teaching Buddhism. And there was a internecine fight between the religions of various people in Tibet. It was all historical data. And Padmasambhava was known as somewhat of a powerful guru magician and he was invited to come to Tibet to help quell this war that was going on. And he taught everybody how to be a Buddhist and how to diminish their suffering. And that became the new religion for Tibet. Now, Buddhism is not really a religion. This is another story. Buddhism tells you how to manage your mind and how to find the off switch. And that was also all studied 800 years ago. So 800 years ago, Padman Zimbabwe wrote this book, Self-Liberation Through Seeing with Naked Awareness, which means quieting your mind, finding the off switch, and you are then able to move your awareness from your ordinary concerns to timeless awareness, which basically is he was teaching people to do remote viewing 800 years ago. And he said, because your nature is timeless awareness, you can move your awareness uh, into the future and into the distance. And the reason you can see into the future is because awareness that is free of time and space doesn't violate cause and effect because you're not moving through that kind of time. You're you're free to move through the universal time, and that's your and your nature is free of time. So no laws, so no laws are broken. So are you are you a and, the, and, the, and this is all eight hundred years ago. Right, that's that's quite remarkable. Are you a Buddhist or are you agnostic? I'm a Buddhist. You're a Buddhist, okay. And, and, and the, the Buddhists don't believe in God. So the question, are you a Buddhist or agnostic, is really not, not a, a good my, question. My apologies for that. You, you see, Buddhism is one of those things that, if you don't understand it well from the outside, is sort of difficult to contend with um, in respect to other religions. Buddhism, so, the goal of Buddhism is to help the practitioners diminish their suffering and help the help them diminish the suffering for other people so they give you a pathway they give you things to do things to buddhism gives you things to do with your mind that are understandable do not require you to believe anything but rather give you things to do to quiet your mind and diminish your suffering and and how did you come to be a Buddhist? Did were you did you grow up in a Buddhist family? No, I grew up in a Jewish family. 
as, <laughs> as many Buddhists do. <laughs> but, but I was, when I left Columbia, I joined the Theosophical Society. And I, I knew about uh, Annie Besant and Blavat Madame Blavatsky, Helena Blavatsky, because my father had published her biography. So I was, as a graduate student, I had already read <clears throat> the biography of Helena Blavatsky who is the founder of Buddhism, founder of the Theosophical Society. And I, I would attend meetings there, and they were happy to have a physicist in tow for the Theosophical meetings. And they wanted to show me that um, 50 years before, Annie Besant had been asked by Madame Blavatsky could she please look into a block of paraffin? Because Annie, the, Helena Ravasky does not get a lot of credit. She, she, was all, she also claimed to be a psychic. So people thought that she was, might be deceiving them, but she was really highly intelligent. So in 1895, she told Annie Besant, that the physicists have now got a periodic table of the elements, which was true. And she said, I think we should have a psychic periodic table of the elements. So I think that you and your partner, who I can't remember right now, great, great psychic, I'd like you to each look at a, ball, a block of paraffin. The paraffin is mainly hydrogen and the atomic um, makeup of something like two hydrogens two, two carbons and 50 hydrogens so so it's more more than more than 50 percent hydrogen of this block so why don't you just look at look at this and start with hydrogen and tell me what you find. Pretty sophisticated thing for a psychic to be doing. And they came back uh, with pictures of the, and I show this in my book, incidentally. They, they came back with pictures of the inner, inner structure of hydrogen, of a hydrogen atom showing that it's made of three larger balls that are connected together by uh, elastic members that look like rubber bands. So it's these three balls connected um, by, by forces of energy that hold them together. And today we would call those balls quarks and call those elastic balls gluons. And the drawing that she made in 1895 is very, very similar to the drawing that you find today describing what a hydrogen atom looks like. And I show that I show that in my in my book. I show the drawing right out of uh, maybe it's too early. You can find it. I'll get I'll get out to you for homework. In, in my in my book, I show Annie Besson's drawing of a quark and the gluons, and on the next page I show uh, a contemporary model of Clark's gluons. And it looks like exactly the same thing that she drew. So that convinced me that the theosophical people are really onto something. So that's an interesting point. And do you do you feel what are your thoughts on sort of the religious landscape as a whole? Do you feel as if Buddhism is the right path to go personally, or do you believe it's the right path to go in general? Well, I certainly don't have ideas about what people should do in general. 
and the wars of wars are fought over that particular path. I think I think that Buddhism is a easier path than many others because it doesn't require you to believe any nonsense. That you can you can sit down with a person and say, if you do this, that, the other thing. You can see, obviously, it's going to diminish your suffering. If you would like to learn how to diminish your suffering, we can show you what to do. And many people, and Buddhism is a popular way of being. And nobody ever said, see, many religions run into trouble because they ask people to believe things that are obviously not true. And, and educated people don't like that. Yeah, that, that's that's an interesting perspective. And so you end your program, your ESP program ended in 95. And so it's been claimed that the program ended then, but perhaps it didn't. What are your beliefs on whether it formally ended or if it continued under a different alias? Well, I'm an experimental researcher, so... What I believe is not a good question. The best data that I have is from my film, where we asked that question to Kit Green. And Kit Green with our psychological contract monitor and Ken Crest with the physics contract monitor. And... I'm, I'm trying to remember what what led led me to to this. I I I, I know well, two of the people in our program were brought in to make sure that we weren't being deceived. So I had as a job my my job at the pro at the program was to show people how to do remote viewing. So I was sort of the um, a psychic in charge of that. Ingo's not going to show you anything. Uh, but but that was my job, is to take people off the floor and show them how to do remote viewing. And and, and I was able to do that pretty successfully. But the thread here is that two of the people that I had were CIA agents were sent to us to see what we were doing, to see if we were deceived or were cheating. So we had a man and a woman, a woman with a PhD uh, in experimental physics, and, and, the, and the guy was a experienced psychic spy for the CIA. And I showed both of them how to do remote viewing, and the woman did extremely well I, I think that her drawing is, is in my book where when her target was a merry-go-round in Rincon Out of Park, and she really nailed it. She did not know what she had drawn, and she, but she said it was some kind of cupola. And at the time, I had an idea what a cupola was. It's a circular structure on top of a usually decorative building. And they greatly resemble the merry-go-round. And 20 years later, I went to Russia with my daughter, who they, was a psychiatrist and a licensed Russian translator. So she was with me visiting Juna Davidashvili, who is a Russian psychic and healer, and Elizabeth would interview Juna, as I've interviewed many other people, and she would interview Juna with regard to where Keith Harari would be hiding two hours in the future in San Francisco. And I was listening to Juna and Elizabeth chatting, all in Russian, so I understood nothing except Juna kept talking about um, cupula, there's this cupula. And I said, I wonder, I said to myself, I wonder if the, the targets are merry-go-round. 
since that was the only word that I understood in the whole dialogue. And it turns out Chipula is the Russian word for merry-go-round. So that's in fact where Harari was hiding at the merry-go-round on Fisherman's Wharf in San Francisco. And that's what Juno was describing. Right. So so I take it you you'd like not to use the word believe, but you don't think that your program has continued past 95. Oh, the, the, the point of my story is that uh, Kit Green in the elevator as we were leaving his building said that uh, we think is that my my understanding is that those two people who I trained up were working with Pat Price in the program that Ken Crest was doing. So Ken Crest hired Pat Price from SRI and Ken, Pat was working with Ken Crest on foreign remote viewing together with the two people that I had trained up. So Ken Chris had a little group of little foursome and uh, Ken Chris told me in the elevator that, that that group is still ongoing. The CIA still has a group of, a small group of people doing remote viewing. Do you do you feel as if brain computer interfaces might help us better understand sort of the the things going on when when we have these sort of um, remote viewing experiences? I I'm sorry, I don't understand your question. I said, do you, do you think that brain computer interfaces um, are going to help us better understand what's going on um, in the, in the mind when remote viewing happens? Well, I think it'll probably help. I don't know. I don't know how how that will be. We understand so little about what's going on in the mind anyway that I think learning that, that I, I don't know enough about it to know that it is, is remote viewing the secret ingredient uh, that brings parts of the mind together. Since remote viewing shows that our mind functioning is non-local, by non-local, I mean it's independent of distance and time. That, that was a big fight. I, Einstein said that looks like it's spooky connection at a distance, by which he meant things that appear to be separate from ordinary physics are actually connected. So uh, and the spooky connection at a distance is what these three guys just got Nobel Prize for. So they were connected, they were concerned that car mechanics shows that you have the spooky connected at a distance. And they, John Clauser had experiments showing that, showing that uh, photons that are born together remain together even over great distances. And that born together remains together over great distances is what Einstein was concerned about. And he called it a, a spooky connection at a distance. He didn't like the idea that you could have uh, photons born together, taken across the universe. You, you chop up one and the other one notices that the twin was damaged. So, uh, the, the, the famous book that was, that was uh, called Twin Telepathy, which is a very interesting book to read by a, an English researcher. And it opens up with a story about a journalist who's getting ready to take his son to the theater. They have the journalist and his son in the living room, and suddenly the journalist falls to the floor. And a few minutes, this is told by the son, who's grown now. And a few minutes later, the phone rang, and they said that my uncle had been shot and killed on a corner in London. So the guy who fell to the floor, fell to the floor because his identical twin brother had just been killed. 
and they call that twin telepathy, which is really our connection at a distance. That Einstein wouldn't like that either. The fact that one guy dies as a result of his brother being killed is certainly a connection at a distance. Right. And, and, it, and it shows that what it shows from my point of view, the, the, the whole book is about uh, it's, uh, twin telepathy, many, many, not experiments, but many, many documented instances where something happens to one twin, usually children. And the most common thing is one kid will get burned and the other one will raise a blister. That, that's sort of the most common thing in, in, in English, you know, two little girls who are playing at, at grandma's house, one of them gets burned and the other one gets hurt. So the, the idea of twin telepathy is exactly what Einstein was worried about. And do you think, you know, it's, it's feasible for us to think of ways in which we can use technology to amplify the signals that we get in remote viewing? Do you think that's something that should be looked at very seriously? I think that'd be a good idea. I'm glad you didn't ask me how I think we should do that. How do you think we should do it? <laughs> well, in a way, um, what I had learned over a decade is how to help people quiet their minds and avoid guessing and naming things. And what I had discovered there is something that was taught explicitly by Padma Zimbabwe 800 years ago. He said, he said, guessing and naming is the enemy of timeless awareness. So this is not new age. This Padma Zimbabwe totally understood how to do this and how to make it work better by getting rid of naming and guessing. Because he, he didn't know that remote viewing was done by the non-analytic portion of the brain whereas naming uh, is done by the analytic portion of the brain. So there was a heyday of left brain, right brain, perhaps a dozen years ago. Left brain, right brain was very popular, very important. Uh, it's still recognized that the two parts of the brain have different functions. Those people thought that I had a stroke a while ago. They were very interested. Well, I, he's left-handed, so it's not going to interfere with his speech, which is true. I lost, I lost the use of a hand, but it didn't interfere with my speech. So, you know, one of the things that I'm sort of when I think about remote viewing that worries me a little bit is if, you know, if it's been proven to be so true for so long, what are some, what, some of the political implications of this? Does this mean that we can spy on presidents and, and, and prime ministers or what, what are there's some? There's much more possible, positive way of putting it. It means that you can't, that you can't hide things anymore. The, with, with, with experienced remote viewers, it means you got to quit lying to each other. And I think that's a good outcome. I think that's one of the reasons that people are afraid of telepathy. If telepathy is real, then you got to quit lying to your girlfriend. Well, I don't know if full transparency is a good thing as well. I think in moderation is probably is, is probably good. Um, I don't think lying is good in any circumstance, but I don't think everything needs to be revealed at all times. Um, so I guess, yeah, I think we can disagree on that. But so, you, so you you have an interesting movie that came out quite a while ago, and now a book, Third Eye Spies. What was what is some of the, what are some of the things that you're trying to get across to the reader, um, and what what should we feel as if we learned once finishing that? Oh, we're trying to show, and Third Eye Spies is a movie. We're trying to show that 
some of the people who are very psychic look like ordinary people. That is, a, there's nothing weird about being psychic. And is is that somewhat the only thing that you were trying to teach people, or is there a way by which people can become? Oh, well, well, what we're trying to teach people is that you're able to look into the distance and look into the future without being crazy. That, that many many people think that psychic psychic abilities is evidence of of brain malfunction. And we're trying to show that. Many of our remote viewers are highly intelligent people. Well, I think part of the reason is that this somewhat hasn't come to the mainstream. And so people haven't heard um, someone that they would consider to be a notable figure speaking about it in serious terms. So they still consider it woo-woo in some sense. Um, I'm, I'm not sure if it's as much that as it is um, you being thought of as crazy for having psychic abilities. Do you think that do you, do you know of any respectable universities that are um, doing psychic research now? Well, University of Virginia used to do research in survival with Ian Stevenson, and I believe that they're still doing work in uh, psychic abilities. I know they're interested in. Uh, synchronicity, which is the I learned about them because I had a lot, a lot of synchronicity getting my program started. I can tell you about them. A nice way to finish up our hour. I was just leaving Sylvania, and I was looking for a way to get support, and I was helping my friend Jean Millay who's a psychologist, she's getting her PhD from an experiment where she was teaching people to synchronize their brain waves. And what she had discovered is that when two people synchronize their brain waves, so not only are they, not only are they both in alpha, but the two brain waves are coherent, then they drop into a very <clears throat> empathetic state. Engel talks about telepathy and talks about telesthesia, where is telepathy is the mind-to-mind -mind connection, and telesthesia is heart-to-heart -heart connection, the kind of thing that uh, Alistair Crowley talked about relating to uh, a sexual connection on the astral plane. We can have a, a heart to heart connection, even though you're quite separated from one another. So I was helping Jean with that as a, as a, as a demonstrator. And I met Mike Murphy at Esalen, who's the owner of Esalen. And he said he really liked the talk I gave on Soviet American re research in parapsychology. And I had just met Lynn Ostrander and Schroeder at a birthday party of my father. So I had a chance to talk with the famous authors about what they had done, about what they had written in their brand new book about psychic ability behind the Iron Curtain. And Mike says, I've been in Russia and I was lecturing, scheduled a lecture um, at Grace Cathedral. And he, I said, that, well, I hope you have a good time. And he then called me the next day on the phone that I'm sick of the dog. I'm not going to be able to give my lecture, but you could give my lecture. You just get on the train and go to Grace Cathedral and you give the lecture that I just had. So that was the first coincidence that Mike Murphy gets sick and I have to give his lecture. So I go to Grace Cathedral and I gave a pretty good lecture. I was quite prepared. And some of the audience came up to me and said, my name is Art Reitz. Uh, I'm in charge of new programs at NASA. And I really liked your talk. 
And because you're a physicist, you could come to my conference on new ideas, speculative physics, and talk to all the scientists, top scientists in America about psychic research in Russia. And I said, yes, I, I, could, I could do that. So that's the second big coincidence that Art Reitz from NASA happens to show up at a conference that Mike Murphy was supposed to give. So I go to that. I guess so I go to St. Simon's Island. I give my talk, and I run into Bernard von Braun, and he was very interested in my talk. And I said, "Well, I brought my ESP teaching machine here. You know, they're interested in interesting NASA and supporting research program." And he scored very, very well with that machine. And he told me about being psychic with his grandmother. And I told him about helping to prevent uh, Apollo 13 from crashing. And he said, I know all about that. Then why don't I take you to Jim Fletcher, who's the administrator of NASA. That's the fourth, fifth coincidence. So he takes me to meet this guy and said, Russ has built stuff for us in the past and he wants to teach astronauts to be psychic to avoid crashes. And Fletcher asked Von Braun, did that make sense to you? And of course, Von Braun had been doing this all of his life as a secret psychic. He said, yeah, I think I think we could probably do that because he built stuff for us in the past. And at that moment, uh, Edgar Mitchell came along and said, I'm working for SRI now to start a program. I could help introduce him to G um, Charlie Anderson. And we could have a meeting with uh, Edgar Mitchell, Art Reese, and me. And I bet we could make a deal. And I, I reminded him that I just met Hal Putoff from a newspaper article, I learned that Hal is working at SRI. And Hal said that since I'm a semi senior, Hal and I were both very well known for our laser work. And Hal said, I'm sure I could get a job for Russ at SRI, especially if he has money. So we fulfilled all of our requirements. We got the astronaut, Hal put off. The guy with the money. We all got together and met with Charlie Anderson, having seven very unlikely events all in a row. And Charlie Anderson said, Yeah, if you keep a low profile, you can come. And of course, we did everything we were supposed to do, except Ingo Uri Geller came to work with us. And we were not able to keep a low profile because Uri Geller's job in the world is to keep a maximum high profile because he's a magician and wants to be a star. And you can't be a star and have a low profile. But because we brought in money from NASA, Defense Intelligence Agency, CIA, and many other agencies, SRI had to keep us because we had so much government support. It would be ridiculous to get rid of a program that would brought in, <clears throat> we're bringing more than a million dollars, bringing in more than a million dollars a year for our program. And we ran, uh, program ran 15 years. So, yeah, I think that's, uh, Russell, I think that's one of the most, you have one of the most incredible stories. And sort of just to close off after that incredible story is, sir, I asked this question to all my guests, which is, what is the most valuable idea at this moment in time, in your opinion? Most val valuable is hard. The most valuable idea that came out of our program is that human beings have the ability, the innate ability to quiet their minds and see into the distance and see into the future. And I think that's the that's the big surprise that, that, that 
that the future the future not only can be known it is known i think is a very valuable idea because what it's see if, if you believe what i just told you the future is not only can be known but it is known what that shows is we significantly misapprehend the nature of the space time we live in it's a pretty serious thing to misapprehend but i think the data is overwhelming that's that's incredible and do you do you believe that that's still the most valuable idea today well, I would say that our work is not largely accepted, so it's going to be uh, so. There's a quant that is the Nobel Prize in quantum mechanics, showing that uh, the the power of entanglement. The three guys got the Nobel Prize, <clears throat> basically challenging Einstein's idea of spooky. What they got a Nobel Prize for is showing the spooky connection at a distance is true. That Einstein said it was evidence of something the matter with quantum mechanics, but it's not something the matter with quantum mechanics. It's something the matter with ordinary physics. Right. Um, well, with that, I want to say, um, Dr. Russell Targ, I'm Mr. Russell Targ. Uh, this has been an incredible interview. I've I've learned a, an amazing amount, and you you've been extremely gracious with your time, and you're 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 a mind worth uh, understanding very deeply. And I hope that we've done that today. Um, and and for those wondering where they can learn more about you, Third Eye Spies is out. It's a wonderful book to get to read and understand your life and your journey. And I want to thank you again for for coming on and having this conversation with me. It's been well, thank you very much for the opportunity. I'm happy to chat with you and deal with all your interesting questions. Well, I think you're one of the greatest minds in in a field of physics and science that's yet to be understood. So, well, I, I appreciate you. Thank you. Thank you.